How many calories are optimal for health? One way to address that is by looking at correlations for average daily calorie intake with big picture biomarkers. So what's the approach? How can we do that? So since April of 2015, I've weighed all of my food every day with a food scale. And those food amounts are then entered into Chronometer. Now note that I'm not sponsored by Chronometer. Any similar uh, uh, app, uh, you know, including my fitness pal or others will work. And then the output data from that, including macro and micronutrients and individual food amounts are in entered into a spreadsheet. Now during that period from April of 2015 through November of 2021, I have up to 33 blood tests. And then each blood test has a corresponding average dietary intake. In other words, if I blood test on day one and then blood test on day 60, for the 59 day period in between blood tests, the average dietary intake during that period corresponds to the second blood test. So with enough blood tests and enough tracked dietary data, we can then look at correlations for blood biomarkers with calorie intake or other macro and micronutrients or individual food amounts. And that can help us answer the question, is calorie intake correlated with big picture biomarkers? So what are the big picture biomarkers? And that's what's shown here. So they include things like glucose, homocysteine, three markers of kidney function, four markers of liver function, all the major lipoproteins, immune cells, red blood cell related measures, inflammation, including high sensitivity C-reactive protein, and then as a composite measure of many of these biomarkers, an overall biological age score using Morgan Levine's PhenoAge and Aging.ai. Now, first note that uh, my average daily calorie intake is not significantly correlated with either of the two biological age scores, including PhenoAge and Aging.ai. So in theory, we could stop here. You know, many may, may say, well, look, your, uh, your calorie intake is not significantly correlated with biological age, so who cares? Just eat your average intake or eat whatever you want, as much as you want, and it doesn't matter. But I prefer greater specificity, and I think there's value in looking at each of the individual biomarkers and then seeing what is calorie intake significantly correlated both in a good direction and, and potentially in a wrong direction. So which blood biomarkers are significantly correlated with calorie intake? And there are four, blood urea nitrogen, BUN, VLDL, so very low density uh, lipoprotein, platelets, and uh, the red blood cell distribution width, RDW. Now I should have noted that on this table, the little n is how many blood tests that I have for each measure. The little r is the correlation coefficient and the p-value is the uh, you know, measure of statistical significance or not, with a p-value less than 0 .0, 0 0.05 being statistically significant. All right, so then the, the next question is, are these correlations going in the right or wrong direction in terms of aging and all-cause mortality risk? And then once we have that information, we'll be able to guide calorie intake until the next blood test. So basically using an evidence-based approach for uh, calorie intake versus systemic biomarkers. So start, let's start with the, the correlation that was the strongest. So VLDL has a correlation coefficient of 0 0.55. So that's where, we're, where we'll start. So the VLDL reference range, and this is using LabCorp's data, is 5 to 40 milligrams per deciliter. And the reference range doesn't tell us if we should be on the low end of the range, in the middle of the range, or the high end of the range in terms of what's optimal for health and potentially longevity. So let's have a look at the aging data. So VLDL increases during aging. And this is in a study of... 3,100 men, I presented this data in another video. If you missed that, I'll link to the right corner, especially since that data also has uh, data, uh, that video also has data for women, which I won't present in this video because I'm only gonna compare my data against what's been published. So again, if anybody's seen uh, or come across studies larger than this study of 3,100 men for VLDL changes during aging, please post it in the comments and I'll give you a shout out in an upcoming video and probably use that data in, in the video also. All right, so during aging, starting from 15-year-olds to 19-year-olds and all the way up through 79-year-olds, we can see that VLDL goes from about 16 to uh, in the mid-30s and 20 to values that are about 29 uh, in 75 to 79-year-olds. In other words, it approximately doubles during aging, starting from 15 years old. So what about uh, all-cause mortality risk? Well, there isn't any data for all-cause mortality risk, or at least I didn't come across any studies for VLDL's association with all-cause all mortality risk, but there is data in relatively large studies for its risk uh, with uh, its associated risk for uh, acute myocardial, myocardial infarction, so heart attack, sudden coronary death, and other coronary death. And as we can see by the title, VLDL greater than 20 is associated with an increased risk for all of these uh, cardiovascular related outcomes, which is what we can see here. So in people that had VLDL less than 20, we can see significantly higher risk for these coronary uh, heart disease related outcomes for people that had VLDL higher than 20. 
So when considering these data that lower is better, especially less than 20, the significant correlation for my calorie intake with VLDL, in other words, a higher calorie intake is significantly correlated with higher VLDL, this is going in the wrong direction. So we can change that black arrow to red, with red indicating going in the wrong direction. All right, so next up uh, in terms of statistical significance and its correlation is the RDW. So first, what is the red blood cell distribution width? So the easiest way to understand it is when there is a normal RDW, all red blood cells have approximately the same size and volume. But when there is a high RDW, there is a variability in red blood cell size and volume. As you can see, there are some red blood cells that are large in size and some that are small. Now the reference range, uh, LabCorp's reference range for RD, the RDW percentage is 11.6 to 15.4. But again, that says nothing about should it be low, should it be in the middle, should it be high in terms of aging and minimizing risk of uh, all-cause mortality risk. So let's have a look at the aging data. So uh, what we're looking at here is RDW on the y-axis plotted against age. And this is in a relatively small study. Again, I, I wasn't able to come across any larger studies for RDW. It's age, for its age-related changes, and if anyone has seen data for that, please post it in the comments, and again, I'll give you a shout out. We'll put that data in another video, in a future video. So what we can see is that there's a significant increase for RDW during aging, all the way up through 95 years of age. So what about all-cause mortality risk? So in this case, this is not a small study. This is data in 3.2 million subjects, and when uh, compared with the hazard ratio of one, when we have the 95% confidence interval that's completely below one, we have significantly reduced risk, or a confidence interval that's uh, completely above one, we have significantly increased all-cause mortality risk, ACM risk. So what we can see is with the data group for RDW in percentiles, uh, we can see that the lowest risk was present for RDW values in the 8.1 to 12.5% range. You can see all of those uh, colored dots and circles and, and, and the green triangles um, are completely below one, indicating a reduced risk. In contrast, uh, significantly increased all-cause mortality risk. So if you look at the percentile, so anything higher than the 75th percentile, which translated into having an RDW greater than 13.1%, was associated with significantly increased all-cause mortality risk. So when considering the aging data and the all-cause mortality data for RDW, that suggests that lower is better. And then we can change that black arrow for RDW to red when considering that calorie intake, a higher calorie intake, is associated with a higher RDW. So that's going in the wrong direction, hence the red arrow. All right, so what about platelets? So again, the pl uh, platelets reference range, and again, and again using LabCorp's data, is 150 to 450 times 10 to the 9 platelets per liter. So platelets decline during aging, which is what we can see here. So starting from uh, 20 years old, going all the way up to 100 years old, we can see that people younger than 60 have platelet levels that are around 235 or less, uh, whereas people older than 70, all the way up to 100 years old, have pla platelets about 210. So there's an age-related decline for platelets. What about all-cause mortality risk? So as you can see in the title, two to 200 to 300 platelets is associated with a maximally reduced all-cause mortality risk. So when 200 to 300 is used as the referent, we can see that there is significantly increased risk both for lower values of platelets, so less than 200, and also higher values of platelets, so 300 and above. So when considering the aging data and, and the all-cause mortality data, it doesn't tell us though within the 200 to 300 range is lower or higher optimal for, for platelets. And then knowing that will help determine if the correlation for calorie intake with platelets is going in the right or wrong direction. And I raise that issue because here's my platelet data in the scatter plot form, not just in the correlation form. And we can see that uh, over the past six and a half years in 30 blood tests, that most of my data is in that 200 to 300 range with the exception of four blood tests out of the 30. Um, but, and the aging data suggests that higher, you know, so somewhere closer to 230 or 235 is better for platelets when compared with the lower values, 210. So if I just follow the aging data, I, I, um, it may be a right guess or a wrong guess. So how can we get some more specificity in terms of where should platelets be in that 200 to 300 range in terms of uh, optimal health. So we, one way we can do that is by looking at correlations for platelets with the big picture biomarkers. So in contrast with looking at correlations for diet with the big picture biomarkers, we can also look at correlations for biomarkers versus other biomarkers, and that can provide more insight. So here we have correlations for platelets with the big picture biomarkers. Now there are, there are at least a couple of scenarios that can happen here. 
In the first scenario, platelets are significantly correlated with more bio biomarkers going in the wrong direction than the right direction. This would suggest that lower platelets in that 200 to 300 range, in my case, may be optimal. And then in another scenario, platelets would be significantly correlated with more biomarkers going in the right direction than the wrong direction, which would suggest that higher platelets in that 200 to 300 range may be optimal. So what's significant? There were seven significant correlations for platelets with these big picture biomarkers. So now the, we want to know, is the, is, are the correlations for platelets with these seven biomarkers, are there more going in the right direction than the wrong direction in order to assess if the correlation for calorie intake with platelets is going in the right direction or not? So three of these are relatively easy to uh, explain. I just presented the data for LDL, uh, sorry, for VLDL. So that's, it. we have a significant uh, positive correlation, meaning higher platelets is correlated with higher VLDL. We know that lower VLDL is um, optimal based on the aging and all-cause mortality data. So this is clearly going in the wrong direction and hence the red arrow. Uh, similarly, for the lymphocyte percentage and monocytes, I presented that data in another video, and if you missed that, it'll be in the right corner. But the percentage of lymphocytes declines during aging and monocytes increase during aging, and based on their correlation with platelets, these are also going in the wrong direction. So, so far, three out of these seven significant, significant correlations for platelets are going in the wrong direction. So if one more of these uh, correlations are going in the wrong direction, then we can conclude that having relatively higher pla platelets in my range may be um, not optimal for health, and we should aim for the lower end of the platelet range. So what about the correlation for platelets with BUN? Is that going in the right direction or the wrong direction? So once again, the blood urea nitrogen BUN reference range is 6 to 24 milligrams per deciliter. And again, if you're only using the reference ranges, that doesn't tell you if it should be low, in the middle, or at the high end of, of the range. So let's take a look at the aging and all-cause mortality data. So first, in the aging data, when we're looking at blood urea nitrogen on the y-axis plotted against age all the way up to 100 years, we can see that the data for men in green and in women in purple, we can see that both of those uh, uh, groups have significantly increased or they have increases for blood urea nitrogen during aging. From values of around 11 for women and 13 for men, that increased past 20 for women in 90-year-olds and above, and uh, approaching 24 in people older, uh, men older than 90. So the aging data suggests that lower for BUN is better. What about the all-cause mortality data? So that we can, in the all-cause mortality data for blood urea nitrogen, which is what, what we're looking at here, it's a U-shaped curve, which means that uh, the lowest all-cause mortality risk was present at about 16 milligrams per deciliter. And then uh, to the left, so lower values and then higher values are both uh, significantly associated with an increased all-cause mortality risk. So when starting with the aging data for men, in other words, starting at a uh, blood, urea nitrogen, blood urea nitrogen of 13 milligrams per deciliter, we can see that it then increased, higher levels of blood urea nitrogen are associated with an increased all-cause mortality risk. And when considering that the platelets higher platelets are correlated, significantly correlated with higher BUN, that suggests that the cor that correlation is going in the wrong direction. Um, so somewhere in the 13 to 16 milligrams per deciliter range for BUN may be optimal, but we don't want to go too low, but we also don't want to go higher than that. So if platelets are associated with higher BUN, that's again going in the wrong direction, and now we can put a red arrow there. Now, don't think I've forgotten about uh, the liver enzymes, AST and ALT, and red blood cells, and I'm actually going to use a similar approach. So those biomarkers, comparing them against other biomarkers and the published literature. And the story may not be how you expect in terms of following the published literature versus my own data, biomarker versus bi biomarkers, in order to determine is lower in the middle or high optimal for health. But that'll be in another video. Stay tuned for that. So to return to our original question in terms of calorie intake and what's optimal for health, a relatively higher calorie intake is significantly correlated with four biomarkers going in the wrong direction and none going in the right direction. So then again, how many calories may be optimal for me? So to address that, we need to take a look at my calorie intake over this six and a half plus year period. So that's what we're looking at here with average daily calorie intake on the y-axis plotted against time. And note that each dot is the average daily calorie intake that corresponds to one of these blood tests. So my average calorie intake during this period is about 2,600 calories per day with um, values as low as about 2,240 down there but then also I've had calorie intakes as high as about 2820 right there. 
Now, when considering that calorie intake has a net negative correlation with these big picture biomarkers, this suggests that I should aim for a calorie intake that is below my average value. If calorie intake was associated with the same amount of biomarkers going the right and the wrong direction, I'd stay with my average intake. And if it was associated with more biomarkers going the right direction than the wrong, I'd actually shoot for a higher than my average intake. So since the net effect is negative, I'm going to shoot for a calorie intake that's below my average intake. And for this blood test that's coming up in about a week and a half, I've been uh, averaging a little bit less than 2,400 calories per day. All right, that's all for now. Uh, if you're interested in more about my attempts to biohack aging, come check us out on Patreon. Thanks for watching. I hope that you enjoyed the video. Have a great day.